Run. Well, welcome everybody once again to On The Road Week and then back to Melbourne perhaps the week after. So it's been a very, very interesting week uh, in Macau. Let's start off with Macau. JP Morgan uh, said that Macau GGR had accelerated even further last week, now up to 400. 100 million miles a non-holiday high and they said that they estimated between 65 and 70 percent of pre-covid levels for mass and around 15 percent for vip even a little bit of rolling going on there let's do some sums on that like we did last week um so 67 and a half percent let's say of of 2019's 20 billion mass would be 13 and a half billion 15% 15% of 2019, 16.5 billion uh, VIP would be 2.5 billion. Add those two numbers together, you get 16 billion US, which is one and a third billion US monthly, which is about 10.7 billion patakas, which is about what it has been. So that seems about right. Uh, Morgan Stanley upped their Macau 2023 EBITDA estimate by 70% and says that EBITDA will likely return to 2019 levels in 2024. Well, let's see China's attitude to that. All these commentators are conveniently ignoring that China has the power to turn the tap on and off like they did before. So let's see how China reacts to that. But so far, so good and fingers crossed. Still with Macau statistics, Macau visitor arrivals up 259% month on month. That number doesn't mean much. The main number is that it was 1.4 1.4 million arrivals in January. So that comes out to 45,000 a day, 42% of the 2019 average of 108,000 a day. Compare that with the GGR that's currently running at about 44% of the 2019 level. So about right. Um, of course, the mix has changed, stronger mass and weaker VIP, but they seem to have cancelled each other out now and settled a little bit. So things are starting to settle down and we're starting to get a, a sense that perhaps the perhaps the monthly um, GGR is going to come in around 11, 12 billion mop per month. I had estimated eight when COVID had gone, but that was assuming China's posture remained unchanged. If China's posture towards McKinney has relaxed just a little then eight could easily be 11 so let's see what happens and as i've said before i'm waiting till the second half of march to make a definitive call on that uh macau's gaming tax was just 2.37 billion us in 2022 very low number compare that with the 12.8 billion in 2019 so it's down around 10 billion from that which leads to the next story that we published this week because fiscal reserves um uh, fall 13 percent uh, in the last 12 months in the 2022 calendar year to 69 billion well uh 10 billion on 69 billion is 14 percent, so that's roughly 13 percent uh so that's how much it's down but that does imply that even if the catastrophe that was 2022 was repeated year after year. Macau did have enough to survive seven more years at, at that disastrous level. So the Macau government is really awash with money still, even though they could uh, arguably sort of complain about the last few years. There's no shortage of cash. It, I often wonder why the streets are not paved with gold in Macau. Uh, still in Macau, Sands China reported uh, US $1.58 billion loss uh, last year for the calendar year 2022. And that's with quite strict cost controls. All the casinos, all the concessionaires, you know, Galaxy, uh, Sands, and the other four have um, implemented quite strict cost controls. Let's do a little bit of circular validation or internal validation on that. I mean, very roughly, Macau is a one to one to one ratio one Sands, one Galaxy, one the other four put together. So, if Sands has lost 1.6 billion, well, triple that, you get roughly 5 billion, which is roughly a billion a quarter, which is roughly what I have been saying over the last few years, they have been losing around a billion a quarter collectively. So that seems about right. Um, this last week, it was announced that Ted Chan would replace uh, Robert Drake as 
Galaxy's uh, CFO. That's uh, great news for Ted. Uh, Ted, of course, was, uh, well, if you go all the way back, he was Altera property president. Then he was Melco Crown, as it was, Melco Crown, as it was back then, COO uh, under, under Lawrence Ho, of course. And then he moved to Galaxy and headed up their Japan operations. And um, when uh, IAG was covering Japan, we had a little bit to do with um, Ted, which was great. Uh, and now he is obviously still with Galaxy and will become their CFO. So there had been some conjecture about uh, where Ted would land within the Galaxy organization. And now we know. And congratulations to uh, Bob Drake. Uh, he oversaw an incredible amount of growth uh, for Galaxy over the years. Just a fantastic job. So uh, well done to him and uh, very, very impressive effort. Uh, still in Macau. Tuck Chun's Levo Chan, the closing arguments on his case will occur on the 8th of March. Uh, we now know that date. Uh, who knows when the sentence will be, but judging on uh, Alvin Chow's 18-year sentence, uh, it's not looking good for Mr Chan, but let's see how that plays out. Uh, Emperor E defended their satellite casino GGR share. This was an interesting story we ran uh, this week. Emperor felt the need to come out and defend uh, uh, the revenue share for the next three years. Of course, the satellite casino is now allowed to continue to do revenue share for three years. My question is, why did they feel the need to defend it? Did someone accuse them of having a, a very low number? They said that the majority of GGR is going to them. I wonder if that is pre or post tax. Um, I wonder if they mean a plura plurality or a majority, to use the American voting expressions, a majority being over 50% of plurality, just being the bigger share than anybody else. And I guess it means a minimum of 32.5%, right? They won't say what percentage it is, but if you take 100%, take off 35% for the special gaming tax, and then halve that, you get 32.5%. So if they've got the majority of that 70 so 65%, it must be over 32 and a half. Anyway, interesting. All right, moving on from Macau. Um, the Philippines this week, uh, just one, one story worthy of mention. Um, Maybank uh, came out and said that the opening of China will only provide limited short-term bo boost for the Philippines. Um, boy, the Philippines is going well, really, really well. Very impressive. Um, they have replaced the loss of China VIP uh, with just local play, basically, and um, a little bit of Korean vi Korean visitation as well, of course. Korean being very, very strong feeder market for the Philippines. But they've bounced back from COVID, and I think they're back to pre-COVID levels or very, very close to it. And it's very, very impressive. So uh, Philippines, of course, being led by Bloomberry, being led by the Solaire property over there. Um, they have done a fantastic job through COVID and post-COVID. And they are the, the, the industry leaders over there. Of course, um, Mr. Enrique Rizon Jr. Uh, as the chairman and CEO and Tom Arasi uh, as the property president there and also you know, director of the company. Uh, well done to both of them. Excellent job there at uh, Bloomberry and at Solaire. Um, but they've got a car to Manila breathing down there next too. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see over the next few years how the Philippines goes as Korea v Korean VIP bounces back they have a very strong locals market and uh, China VIP will bounce back too in 2024 I think not so much in 2023 um, interesting to see and of course I'll be over in the Philippines in March probably probably late March and for much of April I think um, over to Australia now or, or to here to Australia where I am now currently in Melbourne um, Going up to Sydney next week, and boy, Star Entertainment up there in Sydney, have they got some problems? Uh, lead story on Thursday was that they need to raise uh, 800 million Australian dollars in equity after a US $858 million loss in the first half of 2023, um, which of course means the six months to 31st of December 2022. The, the regulatory woes the Australian industry is going through, particularly star particularly in new south wales are um, significant and profound there was a trading halt uh, on the shares while the equity raising was going on um, 685 million australian dollars of that 
eight hundred million raising will be uh, an entitlement offer, and the remaining one hundred fifteen million is being placed with institutional investors. So, and also the uh, Chowto Fook and Far East Consortium. Now, there's a Hong Kong connection here. Um, they both have committed to taking up eighty million Australian dollars of that eight hundred million. That's their entitlement. Uh, so. Uh, a lot of problems there. And then moving on to our next story about, uh, which is a related story, uh, the union boss, the uh, United Workers Union Executive Director, uh, Dario uh, Mojkic, uh, came out and said, look, if this pokies, uh, slot machines to the Americans, but poker machines or pokies to Australians, if this, this pokies tax increase goes through, it will cost a lot of jobs, and this is an unintended consequence, and he's pressured the New South Wales government to rethink this and to discuss uh, the whole issue with the unions and the employer as well, Star Entertainment. The tax on Australian poker machines, uh, sort of around the 20s, there's a sliding scale in New South Wales, sort of around the 20s percent. Uh, they're talking about making that up into more like the 50s percent for uh, the casino, and that's going to make a huge difference and star says if they fully implement this it will cost them 1.6 billion australian dollars in the value of their new south wales business so this is a really really big issue uh for star um also in australia uh forbes came out with its australian uh, richest 50 list for 2023 uh two names we know on it james packer and uh, lynn ainsworth and uh, james packer came in at 17th with a personal fortune of 2.8 billion excuse me <clears throat> and len ainsworth came in at 20 something i think um with uh 2.2 billion i have to say it it's as an australian it's sad to see james packer 17th on the list father kerry packer had been first on the list for I don't know how long, but all the years I was growing up, he was always first every year. And uh, he was a mountain of a man. And it must be very difficult for James Packer to try and fill his shoes, I guess. Uh, just to understand, those of you who don't understand and Kerry Packer, I'm going to put a link uh, below uh, of his infamous and quite brilliant appearance in front of an Australian Parliamentary Select Committee on Print Media. Just go check it out. It's a two minute video. And uh, you'll see the sort of guy he was very, very impressive and uh, must be difficult for James to be 17th on that list that his father was number one on, on for, I don't know how long, but uh, there were 2.2 billion and obviously uh, family, family issues over the years leading to uh, his, he founded Aristocrat and then founded Ainsworth uh, Technologies as well. And there would have been some family issues over the years. Len Ainsworth now 99 years old, great effort. Um, Singapore, over to Singapore, and Genting Singapore announced its 2022 profit up to 258 million US, um, and the second half revenues soaring. Uh, Morgan Stanley upped their, um, sorry, not Morgan Stanley, what am I saying? Um, Namura um, analysts estimated that Resorts World Tentosa now has a 40% market share, 40, 60 between them and Marina Bay Sands. It always used to be about one third, two thirds. So Genting uh, making some inroads. And they, Nomura also estimates that GGR will be roughly uh, back to 90%, or oh, it is roughly back to 90% of pre-COVID levels, so almost fully recovered, uh, which is very interesting. Uh, the second half revenues was 60% higher than the first half revenues, so a real bounce back occurring there. So we can expect the 2023 revenues and profit to be even higher. Over to Cambodia now, well, actually to China, um, but it's about Cambodia. Um, China to help Cambodia on cracking down on online gaming. Well, they've already done this. So what happened here was Cambodia's Prime Minister Hun Sen recently visited China. And uh, during that visit, there was a press conference and the Chinese ambassador to Cambodia, uh, Wang Wintian, came out and said, uh, and I quote, I have the quote here, we must prevent and crack down on transnational crime, human trafficking, drugs, illegal online uh, gambling and other crimes. So they, they're throwing illegal online gambling in the same bucket as human trafficking and drugs and transnational crime. So pretty, pretty strong words there from China. And it was, of course, China's urging of Hun Sin 
uh, to make his directive in 2019 that many online gaming licenses in Cambodia would be null and void from the 1st of January 2020. And this sort of led to the demise of what CNOOKville, or you could say the cleaning up of CNOOKville. So Cambodia is now cleaning up CNOOKville um, that had been uh, had quite a poor reputation. Finally, over and, I, and by the way, I will be visiting Cambodia and Sinukville in the upcoming months. Um, over to Hong Kong now, last story, Hong Kong to pay 2.4 billion Hong Kong, so that's roughly 300, a little bit more than 300 million US per year for the next five years, a new football duty. It's already the largest taxpayer in, in Hong Kong, the Hong Kong Jockey Club, and they already pay a ferocious amount of tax. And the government's using them as a bit of a piggy bank here to get more tax. Um, the Jockey Club has come out and warned that unlicensed competition could profit from this. Um, I think it's worth mentioning the tax versus cleanliness issue that arises here. Uh, you can have sort of dirty illegal operators that don't pay any tax at all and therefore can offer better odds. And if clean, good, regulated, fair, non-cheating, reliable operators come along and be licensed, they pay tax. Now, players, gamblers will be happier to play in a regulated uh, with a regulated operator that's licensed and clean and legitimate. But if the government taxes them too much or too much out of existence, the game they offer is so bad that it will encourage players to go to unlicensed operators that could be skullduggerous and could uh, participate in all kinds of rogue behaviour. So in gambling, there is this issue that governments need to think about. They don't want to tax the operators too much because it will lead to a rise in illegal gambling. Uh, all right, well, that's it for this week. Thanks for listening. And I will see you next week in Sydney. I'll be up there. I'll visit Crown Sydney and give you my thoughts on Crown Sydney. I'm actually going to give you my thoughts on Crown Melbourne as well, but not this week. Um, and of course, I'll be visiting Star and a few other meetings as well I won't go into, but uh, I'm really looking forward to getting up to Sydney next week then back down to Melbourne for a little while, and then the run will continue. So that's it for this week, and bye for now. See you next week. Bye for now. Run.